Hello. Yeah. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Bodies, Barbells, and Bagels. So, where have we been? We went a little MIA, didn't we? We did. For a very special reason. Well, we had the episodes drop with Victoria, and then we had a big gap for about four weeks, yep. and then we had Brendo's drop last week, um, and we've been a little MIA with our own content because we haven't actually announced it on the podcast, no. but what's going on? We have a wee baby coming. Halfway. A wee baby, yeah, and we're not new to it. <laughs> like it's, no. Today we had, well, Alice had her 20... How week, yours? Hour. 20, 20 weeks scan. Yeah. So, so we're 20 weeks into it. Yeah, halfway there. Yeah, and basically we've had a lot of cock blocking from podcasting and what have you, purely because you've been feeling a bit shitty. Feeling a bit. I've been physically vomiting yeah. and barely able to move off the couch from weeks, tw- oh, week 12 to week 17 yeah. were the worst weeks. And then we went to Bali for five days to get away and luckily I started to feel better and... Mm. Now we're back. So I don't want to bore you with like nope. boring stuff about sickness and whatnot. We, um, you know, we're not going to make any apologies because that's life. Yeah. And I think we've already learned as becoming new parents that your baby comes first and foremost before everything else. And uh, to be honest, on my end, I've just been trying to stay afloat and get through my work, look after my clients. And yeah. Everything else has taken a back seat. Um, and that's been the priority. So, and then we both had the flu each for a yeah. week and both lost I got our it voices. Twice. So it was a combination of someone's either vomiting or someone hasn't got a voice. So <laughs> it was a bit of a yeah. nice combo. But anyway, guys, that is life. And I think that's a good little reminder for you guys listening. Like if you're struggling or you're having one of those weeks or one of those months, like just remember that you're human and just do the basics. Like do the things that are going to keep you yeah. um, happy, upbeat. Like don't beat yourself up about things, about slipping behind on a couple of things, maybe missing a few gym sessions, whatever. Like you need to look after yourself numero yeah. uno to be able to function for other people. And that's probably the biggest lesson that this whole pregnancy so far has taught me. Yeah. That, what is yeah. the most important thing is recovery yeah. when it comes to sickness and all this sort of stuff. Because otherwise you're just beating yourself up even more. Yeah, absolutely. So the actual podcast topic for today is going to be um, fertility and pregnancy. We obviously wanted to do this earlier, but we didn't really feel like we should be talking about it until we announced it. And we didn't announce the pregnancy till 12 weeks. We actually did the podcast for Victoria when I was pregnant, but it was a little early Very cryptically. On. Yeah. Almost <laughs> so, slipped up a few times. Yeah. So now that we're at a, there's never a safe zone in pregnancy, no. but at a safer point. Well, they told um, you today that your cervix is nice and strong. It was strong. lovely and my yeah. placenta lovely was good. Cervix. Lovely cervix. Lovely yeah. cervix. It was intact. I could have told intact. them that. Yeah. yeah. She's a strong cervix. Yeah. So now that we are at the halfway point, we think it's a good time now we just want to premise this by saying that we are you know um not you know expert parents we are new parents but we are expert health and fitness professionals so we're going to talk about um pregnancy and fertility from more a nutritional standpoint and a lifestyle standpoint and And our our journey like delving into it practically ourselves yeah because we work with a lot of pregnant people dozens and dozens of people but when it actually happens to you yourself it's it's very different and Mm. there's been quite a lot of eye-openers even for us as educated professionals yeah maybe not on the front of like nutritional training but just like the sickness and all the other little things that you've got to think about and like we said like i've had a lot of dms and i just really struggle to get back to them especially when i was sick i was getting so many women message me especially because we had the miscarriages and we'll talk about that as well say to me oh you know what did you do different the third time when Mm. you know and what have you done and as much as i've put those on my highlights the same questions get asked and you can't really answer in depth in like a one response so yeah. we thought we needed to touch on that in more detail because since i put that out there we realized how many women struggle with it like yeah. we were really shocked like by the amount of when i announced the miscarriage on instagram i remember i had to put my phone down because yeah. you you were like put your phone away because it was upsetting me yeah. like hearing you get a lot of stories. horror stories and yeah and i know that all the women out there who if you did send me a message like i really appreciate it around that time it was just too much i was just still kind of processing it and mm. then like to then be constant reminders in my dms it was like i know people are trying to do the right thing but just for my own personal healing i just needed to be off it yep. um and everyone heals differently everyone goes through things differently so you've just got to like we said do you um, but let's talk now more so um, successful conception, 
fertility. They're going to kind of be the topics we talked about. We're not going to recover the topics we did with Victoria, which is more so around getting your menstrual cycle back and all of that and ovulation. We've already done that. So if you missed that podcast, I would highly suggest going back and yeah, listening to that one. that was a good one. one. Um, but this is more about, you know, actual conception, um, how to like time your conception, how to nail it, how to, you know, get, your, <laughs> get your boys working, your yep. swimmers. Um, and we want to talk about it from male and female. Yeah, yeah. I think the tests that we went through, because we went through a fertility clinic yeah just because we're sciencey nerds yeah so instead of just trying and trying and trying um on your own we also just did it through specialists yeah and there was a few reasons that we went through the specialist which i think was one of our questions so maybe we'll start off with do you want to start off with that or we should get into that later oh we can get to that yeah cool so let's start off first um we've written down some notes because we are organized podcasters so first one shawnee do you know what? Like, this is the one that I, even as what I like to call myself as an educated professional, I never really considered it when people say, we've been trying for a baby for two years. Yeah. You know, like, you think to yourself, how have you been having sex day after yeah. day after day after day for two whole years and you still don't have a baby? But what that actually means and your window of ovulation and conception yep. is a big one. Like, you don't really think about it that much but in a whole year you only really have 12 windows yep because obviously you ovulate three to four days about three to four days so that window uh, like pregnancy is actually quite miraculous yeah and imagine you have a partner who works fifo and they're not ever here aligning with your ovulation dates it becomes a huge one even more challenging and it's like when you're a young girl, probably different for you. I'm sure your mum didn't when say this to you. When I was a young girl? You. When you're yeah. a young girl. I'm a boy now. <laughs> I'm sure your mum would have said stuff I'm to you about like, getting girls pregnant though. But my mum would always be like, you can get pregnant. It's so easy. Yeah. It will just happen. And I used to actually honestly think that you could get pregnant any time of the month when I was a kid. Like I didn't, under- yeah. I didn't know what ovulation was. That- I just thought if I wasn't on my period, I could get pregnant. Pre- that, honestly, that's pretty much what I think most people think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you don't think, okay, well, it's only when you ovulate and and it sounds really stupid but more people than you think don't overly think that in in terms of they're like okay there's only a three to four day window but you think as soon as you're off your period it's you know you're You're ready when you're not you're ripe for a baby but no no because if you think about it when you have your period that's all like your lining and everything Mm. that's it's getting rid of it basically shedding shedding your lining so then when you're the first sort of 10 days of your cycle it's building up that thickness in your lining your progesterone's rising you're having all these changes occur to get you primed for ovulation and and basically you know your egg release so it's only really that small window and people say oh it's bang on day 14 or it's bang Mm. on this day again that's going to differ for everyone which is where again (laughs) if people say they're trying but they're not actually tracking or they're not actually using um at home ovulation kits or a temperature method or anything you might have a 40-day cycle so then you might be ovulating around day 20 or day 15 like so it's this is where unless you have a super regular cycle and you know your body so well you can feel yourself when you're ovulating which sounds really weird but i never used to pay attention to that before we started trying mm. and now i like well not now but i'm obviously not ovulating anymore but when i was i could kind of tell i would start to feel a little hot i would feel temperature rise i would feel more excited down there where sean thought yeah. he was just doing a good job i honestly <laughs> thought that there was i was just doing an amazing job down there <laughs> i just thought it was a yeah. good one this yeah. is going to be quite a crude one yeah. I think, purely because it's going to be a little bit graphic yeah well i think people talk about getting having like talking about having kids and you don't really talk about like sex that yeah. much like you know when it's well that's how you get pregnant yeah <laughs> like, when you are when uh, a female ovulates yeah they tend to get not like not really super wet but it's more like thicker Mucosal. and when they say it's like egg whites yeah and me i just thought i'd made you orgasm about 10 times and it was like yeah <laughs> I'm like, have done my job finished hasn't finished that's just she's ovulating <laughs> so yeah. thanks uh mr specialist for shitting all over my skills yeah you're like i just thought is I was that really no no she's today. just ovulating yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i thought you just really turned on so that's where men you have to be generous lovers and you need to go down there and have a little look at what's going on and oh, yeah. you know have a little prod have a little poke because like a girl doesn't really want to do that like i didn't really want to like stick my fingers yeah. down there i was like when you do a diary and it says 
says, how is your vaginal yeah, mucus? Yeah, no, thank you. It's like, like, well, I'll just get my partner my to partner tell me. My partner to do that. And if your man's not willing to do that, get a new man. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> he should be willing to go down there with like a drop of a hat. Yeah. Like, and, you know, like you're probably going to get something out of it. But like at the same, you've got to give him yeah. incentives. But like. I, had, I have a mate who um, only used to go down on his missus on her birthday. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. Did and she, even then it was grudgingly. And did she, did he break up? Did she break she up? She broke up with him. Oh, yeah. surprise, yeah, surprise. Sorry. Yeah, you got to be a generous lover. <laughs> and like the other thing is it's that, again, it's that window. So you kind of need to start like, um, yeah, when you're trying, thinking about that window and everyone's window of opportunity is going to be a little bit different and a little bit varied, again, based on length of cycle, all of that stuff. Just biology in general. Yeah. We're all very different human everyone's beings. Everyone's so different. Yeah. And the other thing is it's also really, really hard to pinpoint the exact time that that egg is released. Mm. And... Um, um, so that's really, really difficult as well. So you need to be sure that you're in there prior. Um, so in terms of going back to that question, so yeah, when people say they're trying, what do you dictate as actively trying? Yeah. Does that mean that you are tracking your cycle? You are tracking your ovulation? You are having sex at the appropriate times, which would be um, generally four to five days prior your beginning and you're carrying through because again, you don't know when you're going to pinpoint that. So the first time we tried, we, we, I think we hit it a little bit late. We, we thought, literally we waited for ovulation. Yeah. Day. Cause we thought you had to wait for the actual day. So I was doing the at home ovulation yep. kits, which are a really good one to start with. This was prior to seeing the fertility. They're clinic. the ones you just pee on pee and on. Then it tells you whether your HCG is a luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone, yeah. sorry, yeah. So um, HCG is your pregnancy hormone, yeah. so that won't rise. That's what you see on a pregnancy test. You are looking for luteinizing hormone on a, and it'll say LH surge, yeah. um, and then you need to pee on it every single day. I would start about five days out from where I roughly thought my ovulation is. Sometimes I'd start too early and then I'd like run out of sticks. They're expensive. They are, and most of the kits, get the 10-day kits. Don't mm. get the five-day kits. Maybe a seven's fine, but you don't really want any less than five days you kind of want to no. know at least the first few months and then you kind of know closer to that date and then you can maybe use a five day one mm. then um so i started with the actually i think i had a 14 day one that i started with and then yep. i went down to a 10 and then a 7 um and then we were i think with the clinic after that yeah. but it did show because i didn't actually know if i was ovulating so the first one time that we did it, it showed a surge. So I was like, great, that's a sign I'm ovulating. I'm having all the symptoms. So because initially we were worried that I wouldn't um, be ovulating when mm. we started our fertility journey. Because you um, went long after contest prep. No, and not only that, but I had lost my period for several years. I'd only had a regular menstrual cycle for about a year and a half. Um, so I had my concerns fertility-wise. And I also had like in the back of my mind – that I may have PCOS and I'd never checked it. Um, only because I had slightly high testosterone, I struggled sometimes to lose body fat, and there was a few kind of red flags. I always had cortisol issues, and again, a lot of PCOS related is lifestyle. A lot of mine, the lifestyle, had a sluggish thyroid. So in the back of my head, I was like, "There's all these warning signs," but yeah. I'd been too much of a pussy to go and get a uterus <laughs> scan and actually check. Um, so that's probably one thing that we'll again we'll touch on shortly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, going back to that question. So we wait until literally day 14 when yeah. you ovulated to have our first lot of sex. When we think our ovulation was. Yeah. But again, like say for example, you pee on the stick in the morning and then you don't have sex till the night time and that's your day of um, ovulation, you've mm. actually missed that window. You yeah. needed to have banged in the morning. It's only 24 hours in total that the egg is pretty much Yeah, primed. yeah. So what you need to do is sperm stays in the body up to around five days. Yep. So you're better off banging consistently prior to that um, that egg egg drop date. The other reason that we were trying to do it a little later is boys are slower swimmers, sperm-wise. So we were trying to have a boy. Trying to have a boy, yeah. So, and then, but then and... we got to the point where we were like, we don't really care. No. Like, we just want to get pregnant. Um, so that first month, so this is basically our journey. So November, uh, we got back from the UK. That was December. I yep. think we missed, maybe missed that window. Um, no, that was our first month trying. Second month was January. We got pregnant. Yeah. Um, and but, that one we did every second, was it second or third day? That one was every third day. Every third day, but we had sex three or five days prior to ovulation. Yep. And then every third day. Yep. And keep track of this, ladies. Like, I tracked this all in the Flow app. The, not only the days we were having sex, but how I felt, all of the signs and symptoms, um, all of those things, even the luteinizing hormone that was showing up on the little tests, I would say, like dark line, you could take a photo of it. Mm. Um, I kept all mine, I wrote the dates on them, so that was really handy. It's cool well. to see the trend. Yeah, exactly. Get darker so, and darker and darker. Yeah, you've got to kind of be a bit of a nerd with it. Yeah. And then, but that's why it happened 
fairly consistently. Yeah, so we got pregnant pretty much the second month we were actively trying. Yep. But that was a weird one because I didn't think I was pregnant. Um, so what basically happened there is so once you actually um, ovulate, okay, so you have that period. We didn't actually know this either, but you're actually two weeks pregnant at that stage. Yeah, because you've created the egg. Yeah. Which is pretty much half of the baby. Exactly. So the baby's already two weeks old. When you can see. Mid-cycle, yeah. Yeah. And then you stick a sperm in there and it's a two-week-old straight away. Which we didn't know. So we were getting, we were like, how many weeks along are we? And it's really confusing because there's like gestational age and then like fertilization age. So once you get to when you should be having your period, technically you're four weeks. Yep. Pregnant and that one, I don't think. When did you get your? So basically, what happened with that one was I had kind of suspicions that I may be um, because my boobs were really sore, they were bigger, but I didn't really overthink it because it was literally our second month trying. Mm. And then I, um, you were late. I, I peed. Yeah, I was about three or four days late. I peed on a pregnancy test and it showed a very, very mm. faint line, like very faint. And I got a little bit excited. Um, it was very faint. And then literally the next day or that day, I had some bleeding and it was a really, really dark color, very different color to what I normally would have, more of a brown. Um, it was very light, more like a spotting and a little bit more gelatinous. I know that sounds really like <laughs> gross, but um, so I didn't know what was going on. So at this point, we didn't know that much about pregnancy. I started Googling things. I started looking up things and I assumed that it was implantation bleeding. Um, so I got kind of excited, but then I also knew that that could potentially be a miscarriage. So yeah. when you are at that kind of, so I think I would have been about eight to 10 days post ovulation or maybe about two weeks. Um, you are in this weird headspace of if you ever have a bleed, is it implantation or is it a miscarriage? Mm. And that is one of the hardest things for a female and even your partner to go through because every time I would then go to the bathroom, I'd be looking and going, oh my God. So I honestly found the first six weeks of pregnancy the scariest. Um, For that reason, you are constantly on edge of like... Every time you go to the toilet, you're waiting to see something. Yeah, I'd be like, Sean, look at this. (laughs) (laughs) And when I had the blood, I showed you. I was like, like, this doesn't look the normal color. (laughs) And I was showing Sean. So I straight away went to like my GP because we went with the fertility clinic then. Um, he sent me straight away for a pregnancy test. They did a blood test and then he called me and he said, no, your HCG is like literally nothing. So pregnancy hormone. So that was basically what he had said was probably a very early on miscarriage, um, where obviously I'd had something go on because the pregnancy test showed up some HCG, which is what's showing up early Mm. on. But then I'd had that bleed. So it was, it was just basically very early on that the embryo didn't fully, um, In bed for whatever reason. Yeah, it can um, be a lot of things on that one. Weak yeah. sperm. So what happened in the second time anyway? So after that one, so we after, pretty much went straight into another one, didn't we? Um, no, so the first one happened. Then we had our appointment with the fertility clinic, which was already pre-booked for the end of February. I remember that. Um, so that happened at the start of Feb. And then we went in and we met with Vince, who is our doctor at Fertility mm. North. If anyone wants to know what clinic we went to, which is in Joondalup, and they were awesome. Um, so we went in there and we basically told Vince, look, we kind of had this really early on um, miscarriage. We are a little concerned about, you know, X, Y, and Z, told him our medical history. He didn't seem too concerned, but no. he sent us for literally every, every scan. test under the sun. <laughs> scan, blood test. And maybe it'll tap me that day. Yeah. But like, yeah. He sent, so what did he send you for? I went for oh, a lot of blood tests. They test you for all sort of infectious diseases, STIs, um, everything down to, I don't know, tuberculosis and yeah. anything that's going to stop you getting pregnant. Um, and then semen analysis. Uh, what else? He wanted to do a scrotal analysis, but we didn't have to. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky me. But, but yeah, basically a lot of that sort of stuff. But the main one was testing the blood to see how... Uh, they were disease free. Yeah. Then we tested the hormones. So we tested. Do we test testosterone? Yep. Yeah. So testosterone. It was F- slightly higher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure we retested FSH, but LH and all of that jive and semen analysis. Yeah. So the main things that he looked at was previously my all of my results are always very high. 
my testosterone is very, very high. Uh, my LH is very, very high. My FSH is very, very high. And you just assume that that's all good. Yeah, but he looked you on steroids. He looked at my, yeah. Well, are you on steroids? He didn't, even, yeah, he didn't even say hello to me. Literally, the first words he said to me was anabolic steroids. <laughs> what are you on that's and how lie. long? <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay. Um, we thought it was a bit of a dick the first it, yeah. day. And then we realized he actually just had a dry sense of humor. Yeah, and, and he actually, just wanted to get the fuck on with it. we actually liked him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's all right. Yeah. So you obviously told him that you're natural, clearly, yeah. uh, well, that you hadn't used anything no, um, exactly. in that period of time. So, yeah. And then, so the boys' testing is a lot nicer than the girls'. For sure. It's um, not really invasive. I just took a swab down my dick. But... You should explain the sperm test in a sec. But yeah. as a female, um, yeah, I had to have a pap smear. And then, because I hadn't had one recently, I hate getting them done. And that they was don't like, sound like fun. They're not. And that, and I was also bleeding still from the miscarriage. Yeah. So he had to do like a bloody pap smear. I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, and it was him, the doctor. I was like, it's really awkward. If you want, Vince, <laughs> yeah. up to you. I was like, are you sure I can come back? And he's like, no, it's fine. Um, so then they sent me for, um, there was one scan that I missed doing because we fell pregnant again, um, which was like that blue dye that I had to do. Oh, yeah. I can't remember what it was for. It was, to, it was to test my tubes, basically. Yeah. So they make you drink, um, take a tablet, it turns turns like a fluid that you then drink blue inside of your body and it checks your tubes that they're all flushed out and like working efficiently so i did a uterus scan um that i did not realize was vaginal until i got there (laughs) so that was fun um where they shove a big like thing that kind of looks like the pap smear tool up your vag it's quite big it looks like Um, something harry potter would wave around like a wand yeah Yeah. a little bit more girthy how do you think you know you weren't in the room it's the same as the other thing Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> I was like, where were you? Yeah, same scam. Hiding in the corner. I <laughs> was there. Um, so, yeah, then they prod and poke around your ovaries and they saw a very small cyst on my left ovary. It was just next to it. Nothing crazy. Um, and then my right ovary was completely healthy. Um, so no PCOS. So that's what they're checking for there. Obviously, if you have multiple cysts, um, damaged ovaries, all those things, they're going to be looking for that then. Um, and that's kind of what they're checking. They're also checking like the lining and things like that but then that depends on the time of the month you're getting it done so they're just checking for a clear scan there that was the only really invasive test everything else was blood tests like sean now sean explain a semen analysis yeah well it's fun you know (laughs) in america you get paid for that yeah over here you don't have to pay for it but it's pretty cheap yeah. So I think it was $70 for just the basic one to test that your boys are good. So they test you for volume uh, in total, volume uh, of sperm per mil, and the motility as well. So whether they're good swimmers or shit swimmers. Um, and they can do a shitload of other tests, but they didn't have to in so the So you end, want to have, what, high motility High motility and, and a volume. high volume, really, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what? We all think we have high in all of it, but once you jizz in a tiny little cup you realize it's not actually as much as you think no but the whole story was basically uh it's not very romantic it's it's not as easy like i never struggle with that you know i've pretty much got an erection for half of the day yeah you know especially when i'm working at home and she's walking around in her tiny little short shorts um but when it comes to doing it on demand you walk into the clinic you get a dude that hands you a tiny little cup and he says, you know, fill that up as much as you can. Do your best. Do your best, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, you think to yourself, I'm going to need three of these, but you don't in the end. <laughs> but it opens the door and there's this tiny little broom closet with a plastic sofa, which <laughs> all you can think to yourself is, how many, how, how many bare asses have been on this before me? So, you know, I, I dropped my <laughs> pants. baby one. Oh, I was tempted, uh, surely, you know. Uh, I didn't really think about that too much, but... I I dropped my my pants and I laid them gently on the plastic sofa so I don't go arse to arse with someone else's (laughs) germs. Um, It's like going like face down to somebody's non-news, like a towel. Well, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. You know, where someone's just sat to do a bench press, you're going to put yours there as well. (laughs) But um, you shut the door, you've got a TV with all sorts of pornos and magazines and stuff like that. My TV wasn't working. What type of porn were your options? Um, well, my TV was wasn't working, so but you had magazines. I didn't have the option. I had magazines, but luckily I had my phone. But my but battery was, like, was very low. Was there like options for like if you weren't just like straight? Like was there? Oh, I don't know. I didn't really. Porn? I didn't really check if was there was there any lesbian? man well, on les- man. You don't need lesbian in there. Yeah, <laughs> there's well, only dudes um, in there. But there should have been some man on man because a lot of gays have to go through IVF clinics. That's very true. Yeah, I don't know. if Is gay the technical term? Am I allowed to say that or get in trouble? Well, gays both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
yeah. homosexual male. Homosexual males, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I didn't check to see if there was any man on man. Well, they should have. Because they should. How else to? Next time, if we go again, I'll check if there's babies. man on man for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. But no, um, I didn't really explore too much. I had my phone. Yeah. But my battery is very low, so I was like, okay, I'm and against. You didn't have headphones. I'm against either. the clock. It. No, I didn't have headphones. And <laughs> the thing is, they shut the door. And then they stand outside the door and talk about their fucking lunch and, <laughs> and their kids. Sharon's talking about a tuna sandwich. She, exactly, yeah. And I'm like, geez, I'm trying to smash one out here. She's talking about a sandwich or her children. <laughs> she starts talking about a morning throw. Yeah. Oh. Sharon. <laughs> Shush. I'm trying, to, Sharon. I'm trying to beat my meat. <laughs> Sharon's oh, listening. <laughs> Bloody Sharon. But... Yeah. The cup they give you is about the size of a 50 pence piece. But I so honestly didn't understand why you didn't take headphones, didn't charge your phone. I was I like, at least watch some through. porn and like, yeah. yeah, like it just didn't. And then the second time he had to do it because I had to retest. I had to retest, I yeah. said, we leave 10 minutes from the hospital. I said, yeah. why don't you just do it at home? Because it has to be there within 30 minutes. I, I was working. Yeah, because so that I, would have made more sense. So if you yeah. live near a clinic, I would suggest doing beating your meat at home yeah. and then driving it to the clinic. You can't have any help. Apparently, so no yeah. lube, no saliva. You've no just hands got for you've got else. to go in dry. So that was another thing because normally I spit on it. You know, can you not get a little bit, of, get, get a little bit, of, you know, something on there. But so it wasn't as easy as I thought. And then you know you got to remember to take the lid off. That's another thing. So you're almost there, and you think, fuck, I haven't taken the lid off. So you're trying to take <laughs> the lid off with one hand, keep an erection, and keep yourself on the verge of you know. <laughs> I don't know what's Ejaculating. Worse so, you know, you're trying to do those two things at once. Then you finally get the lid off. Remember, this is the size of a 50 cents piece. And I probably missed about a third of it. So it all dribbled down the side. <laughs> and then you got low volume for that. And then I got low volume, <laughs> yeah. I walked in and Vince was like, that was terrible. <laughs> so we got the results back from that one. And they weren't great. And no, we didn't my really... motility was 75%. Yeah, so he's speedy. But Very speedy. That's why we them, had girls. But not enough of them. So not enough of them, no. The, basically, was... we sat down with Vince. He reviewed all our data with us. We had a follow-up appointment. And he said that I was the perfect... Yeah, you were flawless. I was flawless. Yeah. Um, and you were actually the problem. <laughs> so, Sean was actually the issue. And um, so basically, at that point... And we didn't really talk about this on social media. I was because, gutted. Because it was kind of like a boot. It were, I think it, any man, if they hear that their sperm is weak, is going to feel a little bit self conscious. Yeah, like, emasculinated. But yeah. in my head, I was like, I know I can do better than that. <laughs> Purely because A, I missed. B, I had a bad day. Yeah, um, I hadn't slept in about two weeks and I'd been eating shit food. Yeah, so. so you kind of. And we didn't realize that those things have a big impact Very until much, yeah. Vince really spoke to us about it. So, anyway, we had our meeting with Vince and he is. Sean's FSH was also really high, which is also another. Not We again thought it was a good thing, but it's not a good no. thing in terms of males and fertility. So, it has a negative feedback loop with sperm production. Yeah. And then. Um, so, that was a concern. Now, what reasons for FSH being high in a male? Um, things to do with. With like obviously like anabolic steroids that sort of thing Sean obviously hadn't done that no. um, so Vince was like well what else could it be um, so if you have your nuts in like you know jocks all day and they're really really hot yeah. um, hot environments tight panties tight panties which is me. blows to the balls like Sean yep. used to be a boxer to play and, uh, and cricket cricket and used to cycle so all yep. these things where he's like balls tick, tick, are compressed tick. so Men, if you My are trying boys. to be fertile, let your boys like fly yeah. free. If, you, um, if you're around that sort of time when you down. call them down and wear uh, the yeah. the floppy boxer shorts. Yep, cold showers. Whereas I wear sex. the spandex cycling sort of shorts as underwear. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. a chafe. Yeah, and you work in a job where you're in a gym floor, and when it's hot, you actually sweat a lot as a PT. And yeah. when you're walking around with clients and doing those things, same with guys who say work five four underground, mm. like you guys are going to be the same. So um, it's not to say that that will directly influence it, but it can a little bit. Yeah. Well, it can directly, but just the degree of it will vary. Um, so that was our like one thing that he was a little concerned about. Now at that point, they can often throw you on something like HCG, yeah. um, put you on some drugs or hormones. But Vince wasn't that keen because no. it was only one test. So. So he sent Sean for a retest. Now, in that time of the retest, we actually got pregnant. So yeah. what yeah. they started doing, though, with the clinic was they started testing me to pinpoint my exact ovulation. By a blood test. Yes. So that was really cool because the at-home testing kits are pretty good but not 100% accurate. And they also don't test your estrogen and progesterone levels and your changes in hormones. So we also wanted to check that my hormones were rising and surging because you yeah. may be ovulating but you might not be producing enough progesterone or vice versa. So... I was going in for blood tests um, every second day coming up to when they thought my predicted ovulation was, and then we could get a really good ovulation date. So that's always an option.
option um, to pay for an ovulation cycle. I think it was 150 or $200 from memory each time I did that um, tracking period. Um, so it's, it is a little more expensive, but I thought that it was beneficial. We were, we weren't in a hurry, but we did have like, we kind of just wanted to not only learn for our clients about the yeah. process and we were happy to invest that money, but also, um, yeah, we kind of wanted to not fight just us around. Just don't be like, around the bush, literally. I think especially after having one <clears throat> little early on loss. Yeah. And that can also be a sign of complications. So we had that. They were testing my bloods every second day, pinpointed around ovulation. This time around, um, we were having sex every third day because Vince told us, the doctor, not to have it as frequently as every day, which much to Sean's disappointment. Mm. Um, so he wasn't very happy about that. No. But yeah, Vince's suggestion, so from the fertility doctor, he suggested every two to three days, yeah. more likely three, make sure you're starting about five to six days out. And then they often also suggest to continue, say, a day post just in case your ovulation has kind of changed. That was actually more me just making shit up. Yeah. Sean after like, after yeah, she had finished day. ovulating, I was like, let's get another one in because apparently, it pushes according it to there. research, <laughs> as soon as you say according to research, it makes it fact. Yeah. Um, we have another, another one and then, guys, you get another one in. Get another one in. So use yeah. that one. Push it up there. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we just did. And basically, whenever I'd have the blood test, they would send me an email that same day saying, have sex tonight with tonight your partner and tomorrow night, yeah, yeah you love that you're yeah, like great. yay so they tell you pretty much when to bang yep. um and the clinic's awesome because they go first thing in the morning they would email me by about midday to mm. two o'clock and they would send me my progesterone and estrogen um and also around cycle L- lh and fsh um and then basically you track the cycle and then they don't track you for two weeks because that's obviously your window of like if you're going to be pregnant or not and then they get you in for a blood test about 12 days later um, and that's your first i think it's 12 or 14 and that's when they then obviously test if you're pregnant but yeah. because i am the most impatient person <laughs> in the world i of course started doing at-home pregnancy yeah. tests and i did them one really early on and I didn't think I was pregnant. And Sean was like, stop testing. It's too like, early. It's too early. Because it was only about day seven. Yeah. Tests at home don't pick up till about, about day 10. Yeah, unless you've got really high HCG. Yeah. Um, and obviously from the last one, I, my HCG probably wasn't high. So I started doing them. Nothing happened for the first three, I remember. And then the next one, I got a very faint line. I got really excited around day like eight or nine. Um, and then... Well, you uh, went to Bali, didn't you, after that? So... Oh, no, we didn't test this one. No. I'm thinking of the cycle before no, that. No, that was the, the other one. So this one, you, I think you took some pregnancy tests. But I did, you, They didn't right. come up positive, so you went away to Bali. Yes, and then when I was in Bali, I took another pregnancy test over there. Yeah. I was with my friend Kat. I went on a holiday because we needed a little bit of a break, and I was in Bali, and I had to go into a clinic in Bali and find a pregnancy test oh, yeah. because we were going out that night, and I wanted to have a couple of wines, so I wanted to check that I was pregnant. Did the test. I honestly waited about three minutes and then threw it in the bin because it said negative, and I didn't think I was pregnant mm. um, at all. But my girlfriend Kat in Bali had said, "Oh my god, your boobs look gigantic," and I was <laughs> like, "No, nah, I've just put on a bit of body fat," and I just put it down to that. And my period was about five days late by then, um, and we just thought that my cycle was a bit out because of all the stuff that we'd had happen before. So anyway, I didn't think I was pregnant. Yes, I went out. Yes, I had a couple of wines. Now, no, that is not the cause of why we had a miscarriage we spoke to the doctor about it a lot of women don't know they're pregnant for like 10 weeks and do that i'm not a big drinker so it wasn't something that um i need to sit and beat myself up about we literally got back and they wanted to start tracking our next cycle and i went into the fertility clinic the next day i got back from bali and then they ring me that day and they're like you're pregnant pregnant. (laughs) and i was like what Mm. the fuck and at that point i was like five weeks so um and we were about to go to melbourne for arnold's Arnold's, yeah yeah. so they this is in march yeah and then they rang me and they said um your progesterone is really low and your hcg is not super high either so it's quite early on i wasn't concerned about the hcg but the progesterone yes so they called me straight back into the clinic i had to get some progesterone pessaries to take to melbourne with me so explain progesterone pessary okay so progesterone pessary is like a thing that looks like coconut oil but it's hard i don't know why they call it a pessary because that means vaginally it, which is why it's a so suppository yeah but it said pessary on it yeah so i thought they'd mislabeled it so I, I picked them up from the chemist and i said to the girl it says on here to insert rectally yeah. and she was like yeah that's <clears> right and i was like but it's a pessary mm. that doesn't that go in your vagina and I Googled it and I was like having a look and then it was like, you can take progesterone either way. So anyway, I emailed the doctor and I was like, am I meant to be sticking this in my bum or vagina? And he's like, no, it's anally. 
Um, it's less messy. There's less chance of thrush and like um, UTIs. Yeah. And I was like, cool. Well, whatever, whatever you say. The old bum hole holds it in there a bit. Yeah, better, it's apparently. less messy. So because yeah. I've and had other, other friends take it vaginally, and they said it's way more messy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're over at the Arnold Classic. I've got clients on stage. I'm laying in a bed, inserting my anal pessaries. Who's inserting your anal pessaries? You were the first few days. I, I, I was inserting the first them. Two days. Because sure, like, it's, it. yeah. it's easier. It's easier for me to see. Well, you can't see your own bum hole. Yeah. Like, no. yeah. And I didn't want to look in like a mirror. So. And why did you stop me doing it? Because you kept getting erections. I get too excited. <laughs> So this podcast has gone really like yeah, far off yeah. topic. So anyway, we're over at Arnold's. Um, I was having to do that. I was really tired. I remember being really fatigued. I just got back from Bali onto another flight. Not only that, but obviously I was pregnant. The first sort of eight weeks, you generally are tired. Um, plus the progesterone made me feel really hot and really tired. So my poor comp clients had no idea what was going yeah. on. Um, and <clears throat> I was like having to sleep all the time and no one knew at that point except for Sean. Um, so we had the girls on stage on the Friday and then the Saturday we went to the gym. We did a really, really light session. I did upper body. I did shoulders and back. I did nothing crazy. Um, and then I said I was having some cramping on mm. Saturday morning and I just thought it was implantation cramping. And then I said to Sean, really, really weird, but I said, I don't feel pregnant anymore. When yeah. I woke up Saturday morning. You said your boobs feel smaller. And shrunk, yeah. And they they did, didn't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. And that would have been the space of 24 hours. They went from your boobs at like a, what, a double D down yeah. to a, I don't C. know, a large C. Yeah. And I just said, I just something doesn't feel right. Yeah. And we went to the gym and then got home and then I had more cramping, quite bad. And then I went to the toilet and I saw the blood and I was yeah. like, oh. and I just knew in my gut, I looked at Sean and I said straight away and you were trying to be positive and you were like, oh, it might just be implantation. Yeah. Like, message Summer, message your mum. And um, I was like, no. And we were kind of going to wait it out. And then I was like, can we please just go to the yeah. hospital? So luckily there was a woman's hospital in Melbourne just down the road. Obviously we're not at home. If you're listening and- in Melbourne, yeah, they were really good. Yeah, they were. Yeah. yeah. Except for the lady that didn't believe me that I was pregnant when I oh, first yeah, came we in. All, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I can't find your doctor in the system. Oh, yeah, I can't yeah, see your course. results. And I was like, why would I make up that I'm pregnant? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so went into the clinic um, and then they sent me for a blood test and they checked a couple of things. And then I'm sitting in this room. We'd already been there a few hours. It was about midnight or 1 a.m. by this point, And this lady walked back in the doctor and she was like, I'm sorry, but like, yeah, your HCG's dropped. Mm, you're, under five. You're at one, which basically means you're no longer pregnant. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that was our second sort of miscarriage, which was a bit further along. So we started getting more excited about that one. Mm. Um, but we so we just jumped on a plane and flew home, didn't we? Yeah, we are meant to stay in the afternoon because you wanted to watch a bodybuilding. And I just yeah, looked at Sean it. and I was like... I don't want to be around anyone. I don't want to bring someone else's Arnold's down by like bumping into a mate and being like, I just thought I (laughs) miscarried. So I was a bit of a mess um, for a few days. And I think you just get a bit more attached the second time around, especially when Well, how many weeks was that on? Almost six. Six weeks, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a bit further along. Um, So anyway, I won't talk about that whole mindset around that anyway. But it isn't easy, and I honestly didn't think it would be as hard as what it was until I went through it. Um, I think I thought, like, when I've had clients have miscarriages before and friends have miscarriages before, I didn't really understand it. I was a bit like, I got it, but I was a bit like, that's sad, but you'll get pregnant again. I was kind of like, you don't really... And I also thought in my head, well, it's not really a baby yet. It's just a, you know... Sperm and an egg. But it's not. Like, yeah. as soon as you see on a pregnancy test that you're pregnant, that's oh, not a baby. Even, yeah. Like, yeah. you know? So I think that mentally any women out there that have gone through it, like, yeah, it's not easy. And I'm just like, I was apprehensive to post about it on social media and I'm happy that we did because um, even though it was hard sometimes reading through the DMs and things, but the amount of women that messaged me and um said that it helped them and it helped them get through it so fully appreciate yeah. that and you wanted to get it off your chest and i just didn't feel like i was being very real no i yeah. agree yeah um so anyway let's move on from that yeah so after that happened we obviously had concerns well you took a month off for yeah. yourself and yeah. also my my cycle was all over the place yeah. like we didn't know when i was ovulating it was hard to start tracking things again. Yeah. Um, so we went back to Vince. Um, he actually had said in that time that Sean's sperm count had risen from the retest. Yeah, we did a retest and it went up, what, 15,000% or something like that. Yeah. And then, like, why do you think, like, how did we improve that? So 
basically prior to that that test um i had been working a lot a lot of late nights so yeah. very late nights uh, lots of pt sessions i don't get up super early but say i go to bed at two and i wake up at seven thirty, um and i was getting a lot of broken sleep because that was when i had a cold and all that as well so i was snoring and waking myself up so lack of sleep a lot of work um my diet was pretty shit as well um just not i think they just moved out yeah a lot of shitty lack of micronutrients so like i kind of deserve to have shitty counts on that one so what we did is we thought micronutrients so what's full of micronutrients we just did a fuckload of juicing so alice did we buy a juicer yeah yeah alice bought a juicer um we thought what's going to be full of micronutrients no it's not juicing magic it's just it's a nicer more bioavailable way of doing like a multivitamin yeah so we did the whole green juice with lots of fruits lots of veggies minerals vitamins all that sort of shit think about zinc magnesium um, everything you need to produce anything decent in the body uh, so we we're juicing i made more of an effort to sleep i cut down on my training from i don't train a lot but i cut down from uh, four days to three days, managed my recovery a bit better, um, ate a lot better food as well, and then went for a retest, and it had gone from less than 1 million to 15 million. Yep. So it honestly it was just a, a case of stop being a dickhead with your food and cover all bases. I was taking some magnesium, zinc, and vitamin D, and some vitamin C as well, So, mm-hmm. and it made the world of difference. And yeah, normal sperm results are like you want to be over about 10 to 15 million. Yeah. And your original one came back at 0.9 million. Yeah, it was less than one mil. Less than one mil. So So it wasn't a lot. But I mean, it takes one sperm. But if you, the thing is, is the lack, what happens is you need to use a lot of sperm for that one sperm to get to the right place. So like miscarriages can happen when, yes, that sperm gets there, but it's a lazy shit sperm. So it doesn't embed properly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, when it comes to actually trying to conceive, just make sure even guys, just make sure your diet's on point and your recovery and your sleep and you're hydrated and all of that is just all yeah, on point. Even body composition. Yeah. You lost a little bit. Of I, I lost about seven kilos. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I wasn't fat, but you know, I was just not, I was just a bit sluggish. Yeah. Cause we, we built our house at the end of last year, pretty much when we got back from, um, we moved, when did we move to our house? December? December, early December. Yeah, so yeah. if you think about it, we were trying to get pregnant whilst moving into a house that was literally a sand pit. Yeah. <laughs> and we were trying to do all these things at once. And it was just a big learning lesson for me to slow down in particular. Um, so I guess we'll talk about more the um, tips around, like I guess, healthy conception. Um, and then in terms of avoiding miscarriage is probably yeah. a big one. Now, the first thing I would say on that topic is sometimes you can't avoid it. Sometimes it is just a bad embryo. Yeah, and um, just don't take that personally. Yeah. And you're never going to be able to know what did it. Like no. you're never going to know, oh yeah, it was the embryo and there was a chromosome abnormality. So that's what yeah. often can occur, which is what our doctor said to us. Yeah. He said it might be the fact that that chromosome hasn't fully formed, hasn't been a good sperm and your body's way of rejecting it and saying, nope, this pregnancy can't continue. Yeah. Um, which is a good thing because yep. if you had a chrom- chromosomal abnormality and then that progresses, then you might need to have a termination later on, yeah. which is far worse at 12 weeks than at six weeks. Um, so that's number one. That's what he predicted with the second uh, miscarriage. He predicted with the first, it may have been weaker sperm um, because he said to me, he was like so kind and he said, you've done nothing wrong. I said, oh my God, it was the alcohol in Bali. And he <laughs> was like, no, it's not. He said like... He goes, honestly, like caffeine is more dangerous yeah. than alcohol. And that was a big red flag to me. Yeah. I had at that point, though, already pretty much cut caffeine out. I did have one or two in Bali, I remember, because, again, I thought I wasn't pregnant. But it wasn't anything insane. It no. was like one a day, um, if that. And I used to be a, like, five coffee drinker a day. And I was Half coming off pump prep as well. The yeah, monster. Exactly. So I wasn't having any of that. Um So things that I would probably, um, and I did differently probably the third time around, I was much more consciously aware of, was I just scrapped caffeine completely. As soon as he said that, I was like, okay, like I'm done. And then I did some research and a lot of things. And even he said, look, you can probably go up to like, you know, 75, 100 milligrams a day, but mm. I just didn't want to risk it at that point. We'd already had two losses. What's the big deal in me cutting out my coffee? The thing with that is if you go to a coffee shop, like people say, oh, I have my one coffee a yeah, day. What if you is go, that? What is one coffee? Is If you go to a coffee shop and get a large coffee. It's three shots. Yeah. It's three, sometimes four shots. And each shot's like 50 milligrams. So yeah, yeah, 50, 60. So there's 200 milligrams there so easily. So the only coffee I was ever having was one shot of Nespresso, which yeah. is I think 40 milligrams. Yep. 
um, and I was only doing them at home where I could control the amount of caffeine. Um, and I just switched to decaf pods. I just had decaf rock because I like the taste of coffee. Yeah. And a lot of women have DM me on Instagram and they're like, I just can't give up my caffeine. I'm like, dude, if you want a kid, you'll like give up whatever mm. you need to give up. Um, it's all about sacrifice. So I completely cut out caffeine. Even Coke. Um, yeah, even Coca-Cola. Coke. Coca-Cola. So if you think about Coca-Cola has about nine milligrams. And chocolate, sadly. Yeah, chocolate <laughs> as well. But Coca-Cola has about eight or nine milligrams per hundred mils and of caffeine. And we did a bit of like no sugar. But no we sugar, thought there's caffeine-free diet yeah, Coke. Yeah, right? that's exactly it. So we were drinking things like that. Um, I didn't drink at all when I found out I was pregnant, like no caffeine whatsoever. Yeah. When we were at Arnold's, I didn't have any coffee. Um, I didn't have anything like that. So I was doing all the right stuff. So he wasn't concerned like about that. And the other things that we didn't know that can affect miscarriage is travel. So Mm. air pressure early on in pregnancy and I traveled twice. So I'd been to Bali and to Melbourne. Now, how many women out there can honestly say to me that they knew that travel was a slight flight risk for early miscarriage? Like none. (laughs) Like I've never had anyone. There's never a thing on your ticket when you're booking it saying, are you early early (laughs) pregnant? So again, there was kind of all these things where I'm like, okay, I had a little bit of caffeine. I had a little bit of alcohol. I traveled twice. Maybe I fucked things up. Maybe it is my fault. And I really beat myself up a lot about that. When we got back from Arnold's, I was just like, it's all my fault. I've stuffed this up. But again, I didn't know. And that's what our doctor said. He goes, look, there's women that, that don't know out there that do things 10 times worse than you yeah they take drugs and they still get pregnant they're having two red bulls a day and he's like and they still have healthy babies so he's like you are everything else you're doing is right you're eating well you're training but not over training i'd already pulled back on training by that point um so he was really like stop blaming yourself but they are things that moving forward i definitely was more aware of so we just made a rule that we weren't going to travel anywhere for at least the first 12 to 15 weeks yep. of the baby. And we just didn't even think about traveling at all. We were like, let's stay put. This is our next goal. And again, if you have a goal, you'll kind of do anything to get there. Um, other things I changed was probably really tried to get more sleep. Similar things to Sean and the sperm. It's the same for females. Um, I ate more food. I probably actually put on some body fat between December and April. Um, so I probably gained about five kilos post comp. Mm. Um, and I wasn't super lean, but I was, you know, reasonably lean in my period. It started being a bit irregular at the end of comp prep. Um, so eating lots of nutrients, I was training less, not none. You don't need to avoid training, but definitely lower volume and intensity than what I normally would. Um, again, not necessary, but again, it was something that we could control and, um, it just wasn't my focus at that time. So because training is a stress. Yeah. So when people say the word stress, there's, it's such a broad term. Yeah. So, and that's the thing is when like what you needed to do is reduce your stress and and training is one of those stresses yeah so that and just worrying about things in general not taking too much on your plate i was so stressed out when i went to bali like i had work was just killing me um so when i got back from bali definitely backing off work not that i've really done a good job of that Um, (laughs) but um just saying no to more things and just understanding that i couldn't keep doing everything i couldn't keep being like you know business owner, train five, six days a week, look after my clients, look after my mental health, all of that stuff. So it really taught me a lesson, that second miscarriage that I had to slow down Um, because I honestly thought I'd be this woman that could get pregnant and still fly to comps for clients and go to business seminars and do everything that I was normally doing and nothing would change until I actually had the kid. And I was a bit naive in that sense Um, because I also like wanted to stay positive. I was like, oh, everything, you know, will be normal. Mm. Um, So other things I would probably do differently was um, also make sure your iron's nice and rich in your diet. Early on iron intake can be linked as well with miscarriage. You were Um, taking a couple of um, supplements. So folic acid is the yep. standard one. They say that's huge. That prevents a lot of like, you know, um, neural neural stuff with the baby. Defects. Um, zinc, magnesium, uh, vitamin D when I remembered. Um, fish oil is another big one. Omega-3 yeah. is um, linked with it. And then just a better quality diet would be the other one. And yeah. not eating in a calorie deficit. So. If you buy all of that stuff individually, it's pretty cheap. 
Yeah. Because they they tell you to take all of it and men of it, which you well, know, you didn't buy any of that. You didn't buy any of it. I t- I bought one bottle of men of it just I to. Didn't do any of it. But you know, that's I didn't do the expensive. pregnancy prenatals or anything like that. No. I literally just bought the individual ingredients because they are so overpriced. For you what get they ten are. times the amount. So. Yeah. So if you just read the ingredients, yeah. like what was in the men of it? Uh, it was even lower than the Elevit, but it was yeah. literally zinc, magnesium, All the stuff vitamin D, and very low doses as yeah. well. So, so it's like, well, I'll just make that myself. Just buy them yourself. Yeah. yeah. And we already took that stuff anyway. So um, other than that, in the early phases, so we had from there, I'm trying to remember the path now. So that was March. We actually got pregnant around my birthday in April. Yep. We got, we conceived around the 26th of April, which is where we pinpointed it to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So looking back on our tracker and when we had sex, we had sex every second day that time around. There was a couple of times when we had it um, back. I think we did, was it we five did times that, that one? Yeah, because yeah. I remember that was a good one, that one, because <laughs> when you were getting your bloods tested, I remember they would send you through a printout and they, this one said, have sex tonight and tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, and then you would go for another retest. So we had sex tonight and tomorrow night. So twice back yeah. to back, two days back to back, went for a blood test, got the results. They said, again, have sex tonight and tomorrow night so we had to do it again and again it was great (laughs) that was a good month so that one worked that one was successful i think we got one more in yeah and then um i that time around i knew before i went to the clinic um i did a few at-home pregnancy tests they came up they were positive i think it was the next day anyway i was going in so it was pretty like close to so i kind of knew what was going on there and i peed on one of the ones that actually tells you how many weeks and it said like you know one to two or whatever it was was um which again confused you because they say one to two but really at that point you're three to four yeah so um we were obviously super happy i didn't think i was pregnant that time around sean did I was like, nah, it's too soon after the miscarriage. Like yeah. My body's still regulating. I had faith in my boys. Yeah. And um, so this time around, the fertility clinic suggested a few things. I didn't really touch on why they put me on progesterone before, so I'll touch on that. So progesterone, again, like we said earlier, it's going to help thicken the lining of like your uterus and everything there. Hold your cervix nice and strong. Start to form the placenta. So if your progesterone, my progesterone was fine pre-pregnancy. And that's what Mm. I want to premise that by saying. Because a lot of women might be thinking, you know, was your progesterone low prior? No, it wasn't a red flag. It wasn't an issue. It wasn't super high, but it was normal. It was with ridden range. I think it was about 35 or 40 or something like that. It was 40, yeah. Yeah. And um, that's around, obviously, your ovulation time. So when I got back from Bali, it had dipped down to, I think, 35 or 40 again, which is low for when you're actually pregnant. It needs to be like above 50. Um, So that's why they put me on the progesterone. But the doctor also thought it was maybe too late and that my progesterone had already started to dip and it was a little too late to actually fix that problem because the miscarriage only happened three days later. So it had only been on the pessaries for three days. So the second time around, if you have high risk, which is like previous chance of miscarriage, then as soon as they found out I was pregnant, they blood tested me every second day, pretty much. No, twice a week, sorry. Twice a week up until nine or 10 weeks in the pregnancy um, because that is when the placenta starts to take over yeah. um, rather than progesterone in sustaining like the baby's health and the placenta and the cervix and everything going on there. So the first, that's why miscarriage tends to happen in the first 10 weeks because your placenta is really, really strong, but until that forms, you're relying on hormones to sustain yeah. things. So what they did is they didn't put me on progesterone straight away. They tested my bloods at bang on five weeks, it dropped. So the same thing that happened last time. Mm. So what they did as soon as they saw it dip, I remember it dipping down to 40 from about 70. They shoved me on 400 milligrams a day, took that twice a day, really annoying to take. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was again going back in and it would surge back up to 90, 100, which is kind of where they wanted it. Um, so we stayed there until 10 weeks and then we tapered off to once a day rather than twice. And then we went for our 12 week scan and then they do a handover to the doctor rather than the fertility clinic. So uh, basically moral of the story is they probably thought that progesterone um, was one of the things that was causing my miscarriages. And you're not going to know that unless you go through a clinic or you at least get some blood tests done at the local yeah. doctor. Um, so the progesterone really probably saved our baby. Absolutely. And- I, I- would say so yeah and that's why our doctor was like it wasn't you it wasn't a bit of caffeine it was that your body literally wasn't producing enough of this hormone mm. to hold a but birth. how common is that when, yeah. even when we work with people not trying to get pregnant a lot of people when they just feel a bit shitty a lot of women feel a bit mm. shitty you'll send them off for blood tests eventually if you feel it's necessary 
a lot of women have low progesterone. Yeah. I had it post-comp because yeah. I've been on it before. So I had a history of it. It's so, just down regulation. Yeah. And like you can't do anything about that from a nutritional standpoint or anything, um, you know, if that's already a predisposing factor for you. Over time, you can improve your progesterone, stuff like that. But remember, I'd come off comp prep. My hormones were probably still a little sluggish. But the weirdest thing was the fact that it was fine pre-pregnancy. Mm. And then as soon as I'd get pregnant, he was like, your body's just one of those that it's just depleting everything. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that happened. So we're so thankful that they put us on that and that worked for me. But again, take that with a grain of salt because it might not be the one thing that is going to sustain your pregnancy. Yeah. Um, but we learned a lot from that experience. And then from there, what else is there that we really need to touch on around that? I think the thing, if you're someone that hasn't been pregnant, and it was interesting for me, is, no, well, no, you don't have to do blood tests. But what we were seeing was a, a really interesting correlation between uh, HCG levels, because they double every 72 hours. Yeah, which didn't happen in the first one. It didn't, no, not in the first one. But when in this current one, Every 72 hours, it doubles. So in the early stages, say you are you have a pregnancy and it starts off for 40. 72 hours later, it's going to be 80. 72 hours later, it's going to be 160. Another 72 is going to be 320. So those early stages, Alice wasn't feeling that bad. But once you get to where, it, weeks, where it doubles from, say... 2,000 to 4,000. It was 40,000. And then it went up to, it went to 100,000 at one point. (laughs) So it goes from 50 to 100,000. That's that's when you started feeling like shit. Like terrible. Seven weeks in. And that's when I knew I had a healthier pregnancy than the last one. Because we were like. And that's the thing is if you're feeling a bit sick like that, it can be a good thing because HCG um, does, is the hormone that makes you feel a bit. Yeah. crappy whereas with the pregnancies before that i just felt tired so it was almost like a really good sign that i started feeling like nauseous and sick and mm. really fatigued more than the others and um yeah it was a good thing like every time i'd feel sick the doctors were like oh it's fine like it's just your hcg rising mm. so and then you get um what you call hg i'll pronounce that completely wrong so i'm not even going to try but where women have elevated um hcg the entire pregnancy yeah and they're the women that get sickness their entire pregnancy and thank god i don't have that but i thought that at one point when it kept getting worse it was very high yeah and then um but yeah so everyone's hcg is different you can't control that at all um so it's not something you can really like worry about but you do want to see that it's increasing in that first um 10 to 12 weeks yeah so if you are say not going to go through a fertility clinic you don't need that but you want to know that like to try to have a safer pregnancy for the first 10 weeks, I would suggest requesting progesterone and HCG to at least be tested in the first few weeks and then maybe do a repeat test at like week four or five with your local doctor. And then again, if you've got any concerns at week seven, eight, um, then why not? You know, like that's it is why yeah. not? Yeah, it was quite simple. Because next time we probably won't go through a clinic, but we'll request those tests at a yeah. local GP yeah. or We'll ask the fertility clinic once we get pregnant if we can just come up for tra- tracking. Yeah, um, every couple of weeks or whatever. Because I might have the same problem next time where my yeah. progesterone just drops and I don't want to go through another miscarriage. So. Yeah, but we shouldn't need all of the retesting done on ourselves. No, but we know that fertility is not a problem. We just know that holding on and holding maintaining exactly, the pregnancy yeah. is our problem. And then you've got to figure out where your issues lie. So that was an issue for us. But to be honest, for anyone out there that has no predisposing conditions, no issues with their hormones, no issue with their cycle, the man is fully healthy and no potential sperm issues, at least have your sperm tested anyway. But that's it. Like I, I appear to be healthy. Yeah. yeah. Whereas just because I'd had, what, two weeks of unhealthiness my my boys were terrible yeah like so genuinely terrible i think for anyone you may as well just get the basics done with like a gp which you can request to do that and then just start trying naturally do the natural methods track your ovulation do all of that and then look if you've been trying for 6 10 12 months and nothing's happened then maybe seek professional help from a clinic yeah i think Um, so and they were really cool and it really depends how much of a hurry you're in yeah like ours was like age one big factor yeah we always thought that we well i always thought that i would want two kids sean sean didn't really mind he was like i'm happy with one i'm happy with two but i always thought i wanted two kids so i we pretty much got pregnant on my 31st birthday so by the time we have our little girl and i almost said her name she's going i'm going to be almost 32 then if we try for another kid, would probably be at least a year after that. We'd start trying, so you're not going to actually have the kid for two years. 
So the second kid would be around 33, 34. That's the thing um, when you look at timelines is it's, if you want to have more than one kid. Got to get on with it. You, yeah, you can't. Especially if you have a C-section. You can't actually longer, have a child yeah. for, I think you can't start trying or you can have sex, but you well, can't say, start. Yeah. It's not good to um, have them. I think it's within like 18 months apart yeah. or something. So um, it, yeah, that's important because with age and a lot of people don't think about this well number one your egg rate's declining so the chances of you actually getting pregnant and having really good egg quality is getting less and less once you're over the age of like 20 <laughs> like it really it's frightening isn't it i remember scary, i think we yeah. read somewhere where i think like nine i think 16, 19 yeah. was like prime when, age was your prime age which is probably why your parents scare you so much around that age <laughs> um and then the other thing is the increased chances of um, Down syndrome, spina bifida, um, the neurological yeah. conditions. General birth defects. Birth defects. So, you know, you're at a higher risk the closer you push to 35, the closer you are over 35 to 40. I think 40 was, yeah. 35 and 40. Very high. Were, yeah, a lot of the stuff chances. that we read um, that was a lot higher chances. So as much as in like today's generation, everyone seems to be having kids later and later, there is things that you want to think about. And also, we didn't want to have to... Um, well, if we had to do it, we'd have to do it. But to pay for IVF, um, if you are waiting till 35 to 40, that may then be the route you have to go down mm. because you just have less eggs and less quality embryos. So you're then having to go down that route, which is really expensive. Yeah. Um, and look, if we wanted a kid badly enough, we would find the money and we'd do it. But if you can do it five years earlier and save yourself the headache and the money, and it's not just the money, it's the testing for IVF, it's the invasiveness, it's the appointments, it's everything that comes with it. It's not just here's the money, go. And we've got one of our coaches going through it at the moment. Yeah. So if you are going down an IVF journey, follow Jess on Instagram because she shared a lot of her IVF stuff and I think made it a highlight now. Is that Jess Whole Fitness? Yes, Jess Whole Fitness. Or you go on Team Round and then it's all linked to Jess's. So it's been really interesting because Jess has been going through the IVF journey whilst we've been going through ours. Um, and maybe we even, if that's a request, do a podcast with Jess on it. Mm. But... It's been um, very hard for her because you're injecting hormones literally every day on top of going to clinics and tests and so many more tests than what we had to go through. And that's something that is really important to think about. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen. You get some women that fall naturally pregnant at 38 and have no issues, yeah. but you just don't know. I'm yeah, like, you're talking about more often than not and, and yeah. by, you know, science and trends and stuff. Yeah, especially if you are someone who has, say, had... A history of an eating disorder or you're really overweight it can go both ends yeah. of the spectrum if you're really underweight or really overweight they're not great realms to be in from a fertility yeah. standpoint if you've competed year upon year upon year upon year yeah and then you say have also been on the pill for 10 years yeah, then someone. you know there's all those variables you have to think about as well when it comes to this and there is an optimal body composition so yeah really really um overweight obese people will have more of a hard time and really underweight um very ultra lean will also have difficulties there so you yep. kind of want to be in like a happy fat range um somewhere in that middle range which is quite broad like and it's going to differ person to person like if you're someone that's naturally lean and you still get a healthy menstrual cycle and all of this you probably could just you'll probably get pregnant yeah. probably no problems but if you're in a constant calorie deficit to stay that lean then that's a different story and if you're not having a regular cycle and yeah. not doing all those things so it's more about where your natural body fat set point kind True. of sits um, with a balanced lifestyle, yeah. like without overtraining, without under eating, you know, all of that. Um, I would so, yeah. say, I would say let's wrap it up, and I think let's offer some top tips. Yeah. So for which part? I think top tips for guys, top tips for women in regards to this. This whole thing. Yeah. If I you feel were like I've already given some. Yeah, but if yeah. you were to summarize it, um, I think what would you say to women who are thinking of starting to get pregnant, uh, yeah. trying to uh, um, conceive, how would you tell them to go about it? You know, from Cool. So I would say the number one thing that women underestimate is their lifestyle factors. Yeah. So they are... Um, and the caffeine intake. Working too much, which was my part of my problem. Um, stressed out. Like the way you want to think about this is your body doesn't want to bring a baby into an environment that is a stressed state. No. Uh, it doesn't want to produce a child in that state. So really assessing is your life right now going to support a child and if you are in a career do you have a plan do you have an out do you have what if you're like me and you get sick for 13 weeks of your pregnancy and you're couch bound like which is so lucky that i work from home in that regard but um all those things you kind of have to think about so i would say manage your stress 
Look at what's stressing you out. Look at things you can remove that aren't necessary in your life. Um, the next one would be caffeine intake. Mm. Absolutely. Um, you're going to have to cut it down. Um, you know, even during pregnancy, it's really not great for you. I'm back to like one a day now, but only I really only felt safe drinking it about two weeks ago. Um, and then probably also look at other factors. Yeah. Alcohol, um, any drug abuse, obviously don't do that. Um, those sort of things. The other simple ones would be, don't be in a calorie deficit. You don't need to be in a huge surplus, but at least if, and again, it comes back to your body composition. If you're someone who's really overweight, you actually might need to go into a calorie deficit to improve your fertility, yeah. to lose a bit of weight first. Balance your hormones a bit. Balance your hormones out. If you are overweight, your hormones aren't functioning as efficiently. Um, you'll find that you'll have you know issues with imbalance of progesterone, testosterone, all of that, which again is not providing a stable environment for a child to form. Um, if you're a woman who's severely underweight, then you might need to again have accept fat gain. That's probably a big one. Mm. Accept hey, look, if you're going to get pregnant, you're probably going to gain another 15 or 20 kilos yeah. on top of that. So if you're not okay with putting on a few to get fertile, then you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Like, And that's something that I've had to have those hard conversations with clients. I'm going to be honest even with myself. Like it's not an easy thing, but then like you've got to accept that your body is now really functioning for someone else. Yeah. It's not even really your own anymore in that capacity. Um <coughs> So accept fat gain for some women, not all women. Not You don't have to go and jack on kilos if you're at a healthy body composition. Um, and then probably the other one is look at your diet, look at the quality of your food. Um, are there foods in there that are more inflammatory, more stressful within the body? So for me, that would be um, looking at maybe making sure my gut health is really efficient, which is something I've always struggled with. Mm. Not to mention, once you get pregnant, you just get constipated. Um, you so, feel bloated all the time. Yeah, yeah. Const- Especially if you're ramming progesterone, progesterone up your Progesterone, which makes you constipated, which doesn't help. And then you're nauseous, so you can't mm. eat fiber. So it's just a fun... It's been a fun 20 weeks. I don't think I've taken a good poo in the last 20 weeks. <laughs> um, so they'd be my simple tips. Food quality, lifestyle factors. Look at your training volume. If you're training a ton, maybe pull it back a touch. But if you're at a healthy composition and you feel good, don't change anything. Um, don't overthink it is probably a big one. You, there's certain things that I think women overly stress about, especially food when they get pregnant. Yeah. The amount of women that I've had like judgment on Instagram mm. and I've had like not even so much judgment, but women genuinely inbox me saying, oh, I didn't know you could eat that. And it's like me eating, I don't know, a slice of cheese. Like it's yeah. not all cheeses. It's like soft cheeses or in Australia, most of our dairy is pasteurized. So it's pretty safe. Yeah. So not overthinking things and then stressing yourself out to the point of worrying. Um, that would be more so around the actual once you get pregnant. Um, so that first six to eight weeks, my tips there, it's not easy. That's probably where I struggled the most was freaking out that something was going to go wrong. Mm-hmm. It was almost like a gut feeling that something was going to happen. And even with the third miscarriage, they thought, they thought I was having an ectopic pregnancy. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, you had um, stomach pains one day, didn't yeah. you? So you went for an early scan. Well, I went to the clinic and I just said, I'm having some stomach pain when they were doing my blood tests. And, they were, and then I go, it's on one side, it's my left side. And I said, I think I'm just constipated because yeah. it's where your, like, your descending colon is. And she goes, the lady's face just dropped and was like, oh, it might be ectopic, which means that the baby's going outside of your fallopian tubes in your uterus. Yeah. And then the, you have to terminate the pregnancy. So I'd already been through two miscarriages. And then this girl goes, you might be having an ectopic. Just randomly threw that out And there. literally took me straight down. Edu- the, uneducated the, guess. Yeah, took me straight to the clinic. Sean was at work. I'm freaking out. And I'm like, Sean, come down to yeah. the scan with me. And then, nope, little blueberry in there with a little heartbeat ticking away and I was just constipated and had <laughs> gas. Needed a big and old fart and I told shit. them that, but you get constantly freaked out by things like that and people say dumb things to you. You, The biggest thing I had to accept, and this is probably my biggest tip, is you can't control certain things. You can't control if that pregnancy is meant to sustain itself or not. You can't control if something happens. You can't control if even your baby does have a defect or sadly is, you know, you do your NIP testing and something comes up. You can't control any of that. But what you can be is aware, you can be educated, and you can be informed to make the best decisions possible for your circumstance. That's all you can do. And the biggest thing I've learned about pregnancy is let go of control. Um, Yeah, that's probably my biggest one. The one thing I would actually add to that, and this is working with women myself, is I don't think all women, not 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 everyone, but I don't think enough women track their cycle regularly enough. Oh, absolutely. So I think a really good one is that Flow app yep. that you are using. Because not only are you tracking when exactly your uh, period is going to be, uh, so when's day one of your cycle, 
but um, roughly when you're supposed to be ovulating. Or, I mean, also, everyone's um, menstrual cycle is different lengths. Yep. So it can be 24 days, it can be 40 days. It's not days. a normal cycle. And that's yeah. why there's ovulation kits. And if you're thinking about starting to look at conception, start a little bit early by with your tracking. So, mm. you know, get that Flow app, FLO, is it? Yeah. Um, and just look how long your cycle is. And then somewhere in the middle there is going to be your ovulation period. That's where those ovulation sticks come into it. And whether you want to go to a clinic or not, it's just how much more exact you want to be. Yeah. So I think that was a good one. It was kind of fun as well, you know, when you, you're playing around with apps and what have you. Yeah. So I think guy-wise, it's, it's a lot easier. We're very lucky in this that we pretty much just... You know, stick a load in you and well done, you've you've got a baby. We don't have to go through nearly as much as you, but I would say be your best uh healthy self. Yeah. If you if you're drinking beer and eating pizza and just being a general dickhead in terms of uh looking after your body, then you're probably not gonna be very healthy down there. You may think you are, you might not be fat, but you might be lacking a lot of micronutrients. So I would say just pretty simply Make sure you hit all your micronutrients. Get some fruit, get some veg, get your fiber in you. Make sure you feel decent. Make sure you're sleeping well um, and just feel really good. Yeah. That's really easy for guys. We're very lucky with this. Yeah, absolutely. Don't do drugs. Don't smack. I don't say caffeine as well. Like I cut mine down to two a day um, and I felt a lot better. I think another thing for guys listening, if there is any men listening, is... And even females, like, talk to your partner about how you're feeling because I think that sometimes the men aren't aware that you might be struggling mentally with, like, fear of miscarriage or this or that. And Sean was very good at, like, always asking me how I was feeling and what I was going through and really, like, you know, do you need me to get you anything? Or And you need to do those things because, like, literally you guys have one job. Mm. Like, you, you, so have, you need to make like, up for it. Yeah. Because you go for a lot. We don't really do much. Yeah, like how did you find, like, were you shocked by, like, how sick I was or, like, any of that? I think once your HCG was going through the roof, there was a point where you were pretty much on the sofa half of the day. So for me, it was, you know, I'd do my best to get your anti-nausea stuff, um, make you cups of tea or herbal teas. I was doing you, like, ginger lemon and stuff like that for digestion. Like, what can you eat? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> Just trying to get any little snacks in you, you yeah. know. Um, I don't know. What else did I do? Just making sure you were okay. Yeah. And I think as well, like, it. yeah, it's just, you know, it does bring you closer together. And I think when you have a miscarriage, it makes you both realize how much you both want a kid and mm. all of that. And look, if you guys want us to do a podcast on actual pregnancy, like the first trimester, those sort of things, um, you know, tips for training, that sort of stuff, like in a more Maybe, general sense. Maybe, yeah, every trimester once yeah. the wee baby comes along. If that's wanted, but we don't want to make our whole podcast about fertility and pregnancy because I feel like my Instagram's like that at the moment <laughs> and I know some people aren't into it, but this was definitely a requested podcast. Of course, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that will pretty much like wrap it up and... We will have a special guest on next week. And yeah, I just want to say um, thank you to anyone that has supported us in this journey. Um, like even when we did the baby announcement, it had like, I don't know, 2,000 likes or something, which is big yeah, for us crazy. on social yeah. media. Um, hundreds, hundreds of, of comments. comments that I didn't get a chance to reply to everyone. Yeah. Um, we appreciate everyone so much. We appreciate your patience. We just appreciate you all that tune in and that give us your love and support. Give us five star ratings, ratings on and iTunes. iTunes. <laughs> yeah. If you in the comments of iTunes, if you want any specific podcast, just whack a little comment and yeah, let us know. We or know. get it down in the DMs. Yeah, and sometimes that's why we don't put podcasts up because we're like, oh, I don't have any. Like, what are, what do they want? Well, we've like, got topics, but we're not sure if you're interested. Yeah, so. exactly. So we want to know what you want to hear. Um, we love it when you share it on Instagram. You tag us in your stories or put it on your feed. And yeah, like tell us what you want. Um, or what you got straight. from the episodes. Yeah, exactly. So really, that's it. You want to wrap it up? You always do an awkward ending. I'm trying to think of something that's not <laughs> excessively awkward. I was going to wrap it up with a normal thing then, but okay, I pretty go. much said my part. But okay. no, rate us on iTunes. Listen to all of these and any future ones you want, just let us know. But until then... We'll see you next week on Bodies, Barbells, and Bagels. Bye. Deadly.